uh, let's go around and uh, just find out where you are, how you're holding up, who you're with. Uh, Joel, why don't we start with you? Well, we're in uh, Chicago this week. Last uh, week, we're, we left Florida to come to, for Easter back in Chicago, uh, see the kids. Uh, we're in Florida for a month there, and it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, we did actually have perfect weather. We had, uh, you know, obviously there's not a, a lot to do away from the rink. And, uh, you know, so what we do to keep ourselves busy, we'd be going on bike rides, and, uh, and we'd go at, originally, you could go to the beach, you could go play tennis, you could do some other things, and then, uh, then everything kind of got quieted down here. But, uh, you know, over the course of it, you're talking to players, you're, you know, you're, keeping in touch with Dale and you're, you know, you're talking to other players or coaches around the league and, uh, and sorting out things and listening and watching the news and other things as well. Horse racing still going on. So I get at least tuned in to some of that stuff. And, uh, but we're, uh, you know, we're anticipating, it sounds like it's a little more optimistic in the last couple of days than it's been at any point through this process here. And I think, you know, we're all hoping to play at some point, but we're all understanding and appreciative of uh, the frontliners out there that are doing everything they can to uh, keep uh, our health and uh, everybody around us uh, healthy as well. And we're doing our part uh, as best we can. And uh, you know, hopefully this can get resolved and we get back playing. Thanks, Joel. Barry, I know you were in the middle of it, even though you have family all over the country. So uh, where are you, who are you with, and how are you holding up? I'm in uh, in uh, Garden City, New York, uh, just on the island. Uh, we stayed here I'm, uh, with my wife and my two uh, two sons, uh, and uh, we just stayed here. Uh, it's in the middle of everything. Uh, we've got a little bit of space. We've been doing the same thing as Joel, keeping the social distancing. Um, we've been uh, at a point where we get a chance, because it's on the island, there's some really large beaches, so we get to go to Fire Island or, or to Jones Beach and, and, and get some uh, get outside a little bit. Uh, stayed in a lot of routines. Been uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm on a, a coaches chat with a, a number of different coaches and uh, just talking hockey and doing some stuff with our staff and uh, sort of preparing as if we're gonna we're gonna get back playing. So I just want to spend my time when we do get back. I think we're gonna have a lot of issues as coaches. Uh, a lot more issues than we think. So I want to be prepared in all those areas so that any issues come up, we can take care of them and, and be in that right place. But uh, it's really strange times. Uh, in New York, uh, we're right in the middle of it. and uh, we're Not quite in the middle of it, but close enough to it. And it's, it's real. The rest of the country, maybe Canada, don't realize how real this is. And uh, we have some uh, health workers that are they're down the street, those type of things. And uh, they, they sort of keep me informed a little bit when we're talking across the street uh, in that usually after supper sometimes. So uh, it's real and it's, uh, it's important. So hopefully everybody stays safe and gets back. Thanks, Barry. Dave, Lake Barry, I'm in the middle of it. I'm in Manhattan, but I saw a picture of you hiking in the mountains and that got me very jealous. So what, what was that? And how you doing? Uh, good. Thanks. Yeah. I, uh, I kept a home in Arizona. So uh, back in Arizona, uh, the weather's been pretty good here. Uh, I kind of live out kind of back in the hills. So we've got about, I think there's 33,000 acres or something of some hiking. And I can just walk out my door and go for these long walks, which is nice. The weather's pretty good. Other than bumping into a couple of rattlesnakes here and there, it's been, it's been all good. But uh, same thing here, just kind of hunkered down, really uh, uh, spending some time talking to players, um, you know, have a conference call with the coaches and trying to stay relevant on everything and come up with different ideas. Ken Holland and I are, have talked a number of times about different scenarios of playing out. So you're just trying to stay relevant. That I've got uh, my two daughters. I've got one in uh, New Orleans that uh, was kind of an epicenter. So we're keeping track of that. She's uh, She's been good and safe. And my older daughter and our grandchildren are just outside of Seattle. So trying to keep uh, track of everybody there, making sure everybody's safe. So uh, other than that, just kind of hunkered down and hoping to play again and uh, trying to stay uh, stay up to date on news and the happenings, and, and hopefully we get a chance here soon. So, Joel, what do you need to know when you're going into a game against these two guys? Uh, you know, what do you, what do you know you're going to get at, thrown at you? Well, I had the pleasure – of playing with Tippy for a long time. Mm -hmm. I was around Trotsy. He co coached me. He put me out of business as a player. And uh, and uh, we had some fun along the way. Both teams, I, I played uh, around with Trotsy. We coached against him. I don't know how many games I can recall when Trotsy came to St. Louis when he was uh, 
looking for players around the league. He was uh, him and David were looking uh, when they're going into the expansion draft. Like I remember the time we had lunch, we we're talking about uh, his situation and where he was at, and uh, amazing how he was in one place for so long. So you got to give him a lot of credit for just that stability in, the, in our business. We've seen how how, the, uh, how so many guys have moved around over the last few years, and, and he's been in one was in one place for so long and had success uh, on the island immediately too. So he's he's one of those coaches that you got to appreciate that uh, when you're playing Trotsy's team. You better be ready to compete. You'd be ready to play. They don't have any room. They they can frustrate your team. You almost want to get your team to say, "Hey, boys, let's let's." We know that we're not going to get a lot of scoring chances. Let's be ready to play a simple, hard game, and uh, and take your opportunities when they come. But they they check well. They uh, don't give you a lot of room. Um, they beat us three times early in the season this year. Didn't exactly the same mo when we saw them in Nashville. And, uh, and Tippy, we've had some great battles. I knew when we were playing with Tippy that he's going to be one of those guys that's not only going to be a coach, he's got more than that. He's got the mind of a, uh, you know, he thinks a game like, like a different player that I played with. I mean, he's very intellectual or very in tune to what uh, the mindset is on the defensive side of the puck. But out of all the players I ever played with, I thought there's certain guys that were competitive to the next level. I thought Tippy's was a sick level that was unbelievable. Where <laughs> he would play hurt, he would play no matter what situation, you know, and he would give you everything he had. So and then and then he followed it up with a nice career as well as a coach. Um, and then you know he that's the type of guy that he is. I'm not necessarily fiery, but he's very very astute as far as where everybody is on his team. And his teams are well prepared. They play well technically. They're, uh, they can frustrate you, but I think he does give this team or his players a lot of freedom to play. Um, and he, you know, he's been successful. He's always been a good communicator with his players and his teams are, uh, seem like they are always, uh, in tune with, uh, what it takes to win a hockey game. And I think it's always a fun environment to be around with Tippy's a coach and, um, but uh, yeah, you got to be ready against everybody in the league, but, uh, certainly know these guys a lot by being in the Western conference with them and playing with them and knowing them and, and knowing other teams play. I think we're very familiar with how each other's teams play at the end of the day. It's, you know, it's, you know, you're going to have a hard game and it's going to be tight and, uh, you got to be taking advantage of the opportunities when you get them. So Barry, you've been on staffs with these guys and against them at the national level or, and in the NHL level. And, you know, tell me, tell me what. What you, what you think when you think Joe Quenneville and Dave Tippett? Well, you know, well, it's the same thing. So you talk about guys that are in tune with the the athlete, in tune with, uh, you know, the the day. Uh, you know, they're technically strong. They're all that, uh, all those things. But what separates those two guys is how they're in tune with their their team. You talk about getting your players to play to the next level. I, I know uh, we Joel's had some young teams, and he's you watched them grow and become champions in, in Chicago. That didn't happen by accident. That that was methodically him being Joel Quinville, the way he coaches, the way he gets the most out of his players. And the same with Dave Tippett. Dave, Dave is in a situation in Arizona. You talk about getting every ounce of everything out of every player. I, I think that's what these two guys do the best. I mean, that's that's the X factor when they go in. I know you're not going to be able to outthink them. You're not going to be able to uh, to X and O them out of, out of the rink. They have that X factor. They get their guys to stay on task and and play the way they want them to play. And they have a really good understanding of the game and how to get those guys to play the game that's necessary to win. And and that's to me, those two guys are are, are the best in the business. I I. I, if there's anybody I study, there's a couple teams, a couple coaches around the league that you look at how they, they coach, they look at how they, they handle their, their players. Uh, I'm telling these guys now, but uh, I do spend a lot of time watching what they do with their teams because they've had so much success. And we're in this business of, of stealing and trying to make it a little bit better that fits your own personality. These are two gentlemen that I, I've done that. Uh, everything from the uh, World Cup of hockey to the to the uh, uh, some world championships we've had success together. Uh, but th the biggest thing is they're they're real. They're the real guys. They're they're uh, what you see is what you get, and that's what I think a player likes the most about the 
playing for for uh, Joel and uh, also for Tippy. I think they're both outstanding that way. So, and all the technical stuff, all that, they are top shelf. So, uh, better they're they're almost better people than they are coaches because I know both of them and I know their families and the quality of people that they are. That's great. Dave, let me ask you something. What was in the water in Hartford? I mean, you look at the tree there, and there are a lot of coaches, GMs. Uh, you know, I, w- w- what was going on there? Did you know that when you were playing with these guys? You know what? I, I talked to somebody a couple of weeks ago about that whole situation. It was really – it was a unique situation because we had, we had such good people. I think the, the key behind it all was Emil Francis, the general manager. Mm-hmm. And he, he – uh, you know, had a collection of players. There was a good group of players that were there that were kind of the core core of the group. And uh, we were there a long time. We made Hartford our home. You know, it's kind of different now where everybody kind of scatters in the summer. Everybody was living there in the summer. Um, we all were members of different golf courses, so we played each other's golf courses all the time. But just a, just a real good group of great people. And coaching was different then. You know, you had – Every team had a couple coaches and you, there wasn't a lot of video. And we had a group that we used to have meetings just with players. I remember Mike Leute and Joel and, and Dean Avison and, uh, you know, Dougie Jarvis standing around a blackboard trying to figure out how we were going to defend the Stastny's or how we were going to take Lafleur's one-timer away in Montreal. Or something. And they're just, you know, there wasn't the coaching at the level that was then. But, but we all, you know, we looked at that and, and did things that were uh, trying to figure out the game, how we're going to win. And we were kind of a small market team that, you know, everybody was always, we were the underdogs. So we were always looking for advantages that we had. We just had good hockey people, people that competed hard and really smart hockey people that um, loved talking the game, whether it was in the dressing room or after practice, having a beer for lunch or wherever you were, we were it was a good group. And, it's amazing how many of these guys have guys have stayed friends to this day and uh, and remember those good old days. So each of you have coached or are coaching truly elite players. And I, I think in some ways that might be as difficult or more difficult than, than coaching other players. So let me ask Dave, uh, you know, when you, you have a structure and you have a system and you want to do certain things, but when you have Connor McDavid on your team and he can do what he can do, what, how does that adjust the way you do what you do? Well, first of all, Connor, both Connor and Leon, they're they're great young players, like unbelievable talents. But they uh, they both recognize that individual players don't win championships. You know, uh, teams win championships. So they've uh, they've been really strong advocates of making sure that they're playing a team structure. They know that they have a role to play, and a big role in our team. And I believe that, you know, players like that, you've got to give them the, allow them to be themselves, allow them to uh, maximize the assets they have, which are, are obviously outstanding. But that being said, they still have to buy into some of the team structure that we're dealing with because the team's trying to win. And I'm really fortunate. Both of those guys are, they're hungry to win. They know they have to do their part, but uh, playing without the puck, both of them have really tried to, to buy into what the team is doing and we've been able to find some results. Uh, My biggest chore this year was they were together a long time and they were outstanding together. I was, I was trying to maybe get them apart a little bit to balance. (laughs) So that was my biggest chore with the two of them to, to uh, uh, find some players to play with them so we could be, have a little more balance, but both have been outstanding and just phenomenal hockey players, but, uh, from a coaching standpoint, the ability to uh, talk to them, relate with them, them wanting to do what's best for the team is uh, that's one of the biggest things this year that I've taken out of uh, Edmonton is just their commitment to try to play as a team and to win has been phenomenal. Yeah. Joel, you coach three of the top 100 players in NHL history, but uh, the one unique one that I'd like to ask you about for this purpose is Patrick Kane, who, you know, you don't know where he's going to be on the ice and that's his, that's his skill and wizardry. Well, Kaner fits us what we're talking about perfectly because I, you know, I look back when I first had him. Uh, you know, he's a young kid, uh, played the year before, had an outstanding start to his career, and Kaner, I got to give him all the credit. 
every single year he came into camp the next year, he was bigger, stronger, and fit. And he was committed to doing whatever he could to be better. I thought he immediately improved his defensive side of the game. He had the best ability in the league of demanding the puck. Uh, no matter where he'd go, he'd, he'd actually put himself in a position to get the puck, which is, might not have been the whole structure. But we do give our team offensively a lot of freedom to play. And he, you know, he wants the puck, let him go, play to his strengths. But he did uh, buy in, like Tippy was saying, to playing in his own end, uh, you know, working along the walls. Uh, he found ways to come up with possession in those type of situations. But he did a lot of that where he, he – does a lot of preparing away from the game of what he can do to better himself on a regular basis. Um, but I find that his commitment to improve his overall game was in place. So every year we got a better Patrick Kane, which is an incredible asset to have as a coach. And, uh, and that's made us a, a big part of our success was Kaner's, uh, you know, he didn't, he was never satisfied. He always wanted the puck. He wanted more ice time. He, you know, you got to give him credit that he just didn't get take advantage. He wants the puck, and he gets sour at his line mates when they have a bad shift, and he keeps each other accountable. And uh, he's a competitive uh, guy, like uh, to a different degree, but uh, he wants to have success, and uh, you know, he wants to win. And uh, you know, I've been fortunate to be around it. And uh, you know, when your best players uh, deliver that message just by how they play or come to the rink and prepare every day. You know, it makes, uh, makes our life a lot easier. And uh, a special player, very fortunate to be around him. And, uh, you know, he's he's still going to be keep doing this for as long as he wants to. Barry, a lot of what Joel just said about Patrick Kane seems to apply directly to Alex Ovechkin, a guy who I, I think if you had to take a vote in the league before you got him, they would say who's the hardest player in the league to coach. And a lot of people might have said him, and probably because he was misunderstood. Yeah, I, I think a little bit of misunderstanding. One thing that uh, – that, uh, is undeniable is always passion for the game. I mean, this guy loves to play. He loves everything about being Alex Ovechkin, playing for the Washington Capitals, playing in the National Hockey League. Um, unbelievable. Uh, the biggest thing with, with Alex is that, you know, there's a lot of frustration in Washington and, and getting him to grow a little bit in a lot of the values, you know, having a different value for things that don't take talent. Uh, and, and by doing that, we, he became a really good captain. Uh, I think, you know, as a young player, he was one of the most dynamic players in the league and he, he produced. And, uh, the thing that was missing with Alex was the, the, the winning. There was a lot of questions if you could, you know, win with Alex and there's no question you could win with Alex. I just think he just needed a little, little direction. And, and he, we sat down, we, we formed a relationship. Um, he got better at things that he didn't maybe value as much. Uh, and, and once he get, did that, it was very easy to follow Alex. The year that uh, we won the cup, it was easy to follow Alex. He had bought into, you know, he was getting a little frustrated. We hadn't won. We had some good teams. We fell short to the Penguins in two years in a row. They went on to win the cup. And there was a little bit of a frustration. And I said, yeah, if you stick with it, they'll follow you. And if you do this, this, and this, I guarantee you they'll follow you and, you'll, and, and everything will be washed away. And the one thing that I said to him, I think uh, he always had a great understanding of how impactful he has been into the National Hockey League, him and Sidney Crosby, uh, after the lockout. Those two guys are the face of the NHL. They in some ways saved the NHL. And a lot of people were, were jumping on Ovi uh, for the wrong reasons. Um, he's inspired so many people to become hockey fans. He's inspired so many young men to want to play like Alex Ovechkin, want to do the things, want to play with the emotion, want to do all those things because he's, he's exciting. He brings you out of your seat. And he really bought into the fact that his legacy would not be defined by everybody else uh, by having a cup or not. His legacy would be that he was one of the greatest players and maybe the be I think the best goal scorer that's ever played the game. Um, and his legacy is the inspiration that he's brought. And when he sort of let go of chasing the cup, that's the only thing that's going to hold him back. He, there was a freeness to him. And the, the year we won the cup, that, that freeness was in the playoffs. And he, he did all the, the things that were necessary as a leader for the rest of the team to want to follow. And he led by example. And he, he became the uh, playoff MVP, and he's a tremendous young man, and, and he's, a, he's turned out to be a, 
a fabulous father. You follow him. I follow him on Instagram and you see all the things that he's doing to his son. You knew he's a very caring person. And that's where uh, a lot of people misunderstood Ovi is that they didn't think he cared and he cares greatly. And that was where, if there's any misunderstanding uh, by the public or people, it was that he, he did care and he cared deeply. And it, uh, uh, he was really a pleasure to coach. He, he's, uh, he's a guy that, uh, uh, you could be very blunt with and, uh, and didn't take it personal. And uh, he was great to work with for the four years.